Okay, so we'll um, now switch gears and jump into compression molding. And this is something we do all the time. This is a very, uh, very common uh, process. So here's a few examples. Um, where we see it most is for O-rings or gaskets and seals. Um, you can also see it for couples uh, and hoses and fittings. And in terms of the advantages, um, you can use massively different wall thicknesses. So again, for injection molding, which is always kind of the baseline we look at, you typically want a two millimeter wall, whereas compression molding, you can have you know, an inch down to basically nothing, and it's, um, the process uh, will adapt to that. There's no flow lines or any sort of knitting. Um, so you can imagine if you're building an O-ring, if you injection molded, injected that, you know, there's, um, you're going to have a gate coming in and then a knit line here, and it's going to not be as strong where the plastic has to fuse. Whereas uh, with the compression molding technique, it's uniform everywhere. Um, so that's incredibly, uh, incredibly useful. It's very low cost, uh, suitable for high volume. And again, the way you get the high volume is even though it has a long cycle time of typically six to eight minutes, you do multiple cavities. And because it's a relatively low pressure mold, it's not too expensive to, uh, to be able to produce those multiple cavities. You can use flexible materials, which is huge. So one of the common things that you'll see compression molded is the uh, buttons on a remote. So if you think of your TV remote, um, those are all, the, the underlying buttons are all gonna be compression molded. And if you take it apart, you'll see the meat of the button is often quite thick, and then it's got a very thin um, interstitial um, tissue connecting the, the buttons. Uh, you can use thermosets. Usually everything we use in injection molding is typically a thermoplastic, so this opens up a whole different category of materials at your disposal. Um, you can get great surface finishes. Uh, due to the process, which we'll talk about in a sec, there's very low residual stress, whereas, uh, again, injection molding, um, you typically, as you freeze the, the part, you can capture some of that stress in there, which will cause it to deflect later. On the downside, um, as we talked about, it's a slow cycle time, so you do need multiple cavities. And where multiple cavities gets tricky is every cavity is going to be slightly different. Um, ideally, you'd want them all the same, but just due to the nature of the world we live in, there's going to be slight variations. So you have to make sure that all of them are within the tolerance of your design so that they'll all work um, equally effectively. Otherwise, it gets into a giant um, debugging nightmare that you're trying to figure out, oh, cavity five for some you know, cavity five out of 50 doesn't work, and that's just a really a big pain to track down. Um, you can't regrind the excess. So there is um, typically a flash trimming process, and it's often manual where you have to, um, that like this process is in, uh, inherently creates flash, so you have to strip that off and you can't, you can't reuse it because it's a thermoset. Usually a little bit simpler parts. Um, the labor cost is higher because of the manual extraction of the flash. And usually you'll see a planar part, um, although you certainly can do some hollow ones if you put a mandrel in there. But it doesn't have the range of, say, injection molding, where you, you know, have a lot more freedom in what you design. What's flash? Uh, flash is a great, that's a great question. When you have the two parts of a clamshell mold come together, a little bit of resin is going to sneak out the sides. Uh, if you've ever built a model, like a model kit, um, usually what you get there, it's injection molded and it's a shot. And because the molds are always tired and worn, there's all sorts of flash that comes out in the runners. Um, so that, that's flash. The way um, compression molding works is it always creates flash um, that you have to tear off. So here's a, um, basically a, a quick look at it is you put the charge, which is the unvulcanized, say, rubber, into effectively what is a waffle iron. So it's an open mold. Uh, the mold is going to close and heat. Often it'll hit a few times just to outgas in the beginning. And then that causes the, um, the shot to, or the, the charge to crosslink and then hold its form. So initially it's like chewing gum when you put it in, but when it's done, it's very um, rigid and it will hold its shape and return to it. And then basically the, the tool open, the worker will pull out the, um, the charge, strip off the parts, and then it goes on to the next step. Some factories can do some really cool post-machining. So what they'll do is they'll actually, with liquid nitrogen, freeze the part, and they can turn and machine it, whereas otherwise you, know, you can't really machine a flexible part easily. Um, so it's absolutely incredible what, what can be done. 
here's an uh, overview of the part. So the tool is going to open. And we'll see the worker pull out the part here. So the thing that's stringing them together is all of the flash. And then these are all the great advantages of it. Um, so that's a, a quick overview. In terms of the design guidelines, so again, typically planar flat parts, although if you do use a mandrel, you can get a, like a, a nice round um, tube. So if you think of your radiator in a car, like being able to build a flexible part that accepts that. This may be a good part. Uh, it's fine to have non-uniform wall thickness, which is a really great degree of freedom in, in your design. And then again, being able to use flexible components. And it's pretty easy uh, to vary the material. So if you have a, often what we're trying to do is figure out what the right durometer is or how stiff should a part be. And with this, by varying the charge material, you can get different durometers and very easily tune it without having to make a commitment to one um, resin up front. So if you think of injection molding, they all have big shrinkages that you have to account for, whereas here you have a lot more variation on that scale. And then of your materials, uh, this is just a few of them, but certainly natural rubber, uh, silicone is great. Um, you can do phenolic, which is a nice um, high temperature uh, thermal set, uh, anything that you might use near an oven or near a heating area. And yeah, there's, there's plenty of different resins to, to pick from. Um, so anytime you're thinking like O-rings or flexible members, or if you're designing a remote, uh, compression molding is a great thing to consider. Phenolic is pretty hard though, right? It's extremely hard, yes. It's not flexible at all. Big light. Yep, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's a solid. So you do have a fair... Uh, not in its uncured state. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, when it's exactly once it's cured, it's it's very stiff. So that's a quick overview of these two. Any any questions? So you can you can injection mold silicone and you can compression mold silicone. Yeah, they're when, different. When would you use one versus the other? That's a great question. So there's um, uh, TPEs, which are the flexible grade of injection moldable uh, material. And typically, the injection mold grades are, I have found them in my experience, five to 10 times more expensive than, a, than ABS is sort of like the baseline. So they would typically be more expensive on the injection molded side. And then you ha you're sort of limited by the, um, the mold constraints for injection molding. So you do need uniform wall thickness. You are going to get knit lines. A lot of it would be driven by the, the geometry. In general, the injection molding would have a little tighter tolerance. So if for some reason you're doing a flexible part that needed to be super tight on the tolerance, you may consider it for that. Where we did it is on the, um, the first Roomba wheels. It had a flexible tread, which was a lot easier due to the geometry to injection mold. We had a disc gate where if this is the tread, the sprue came down and then it was basically a round edge gate that we'd eventually cut off, and then it, it had the, you know, the geometry would, that would grab the hub. Um, we ran, it, ran into some interesting problems there in that the factory was regrinding the treads, and what would happen is you shot them, there was a double bond in there, and the heat would denature it such that the material wasn't as strong the second time around. You'd also get a little bit of can, contamination, because it's always the case. So the tires would go on and hold for a, maybe a month or two, but then they would just spontaneously fall off. And that's like one of the worst, like if from a quality standpoint, if you've got something that breaks right off the bat, that's awesome because anybody's going to find it. But the ones that break after two months and some percentage of the, night, of the units is just a nightmare. Two months worth of units. Yeah, I mean, we were lucky. We were super low and we were like, we hadn't built up much volume and we figured it out, but that was a lot of scrambling. So. Yeah, the whole quality thing's, uh, uh, well, actually, it's a great lead-in for Bill, who will talk about that next time. Awesome. Well, thank you.